Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Morning Coffee Review. We're back after a week hiatus. Um, Michael and I got to go to our headquarters in Little Rock, Arkansas, and hang out with Matt Lynn and Kyle Lee and Kyle Davis and our whole ATG crew. Um, just a gold, good week of learning from one another, having a good time, and and you know sharing stories and and getting caught up again. So thanks for dealing with our break and thanks for welcome back. And uh, we are going to talk about a whole bunch of interesting things today. How are you doing today, Michael? Good. Excited for some of the updates. Was super elated to see you in person, see Matt in person, um, and Kyle and Kyle Davis as well. It was awesome to see the team. Super excited to be back as well and keep our momentum of our tech team moving forward. So it was good to do that. We had awards. We had some trainings. Kind of just giving you a little bit of depth of what we add value back to our technical team here at ATG. Um, but excited today we do have a topic today we're going to be talking about revit and integration with review there were some topics that we've had before in terms of the ability to do batch stamping and we'll go through and test that live it's been replicated apparently before but we'll go through and see if we can replicate it um, but there's also some news so some news happened while we were gone um, and i'll let jason kind of run through that news that happened too yeah, so there's a couple things that happened um, last week, and let me share my screen real quick. Um, you may have seen a message pop up on Studio. So starting August 27th, viewing of drawings, punch lists, RFI submittals, map features, and Bluebeam Cloud projects will no, no longer be available. And I think we talked about this like two or three episodes ago. So pretty recent. Ignore what we said. It's all going away. <laughs> Right. Um, so you'll not be able to access or work on these files anymore um, through Bluebeam Cloud. But if you read on, we are replacing them with a studio platform for web and mobile, making it easy to use Bluebeam anywhere. So it, it looks like they're going to just merge everything. All the RFI, punch items, all that stuff is going to be inside of a studio session. Um, and, and then your studio projects are going to be sort of offer a centralized thing, which of course makes us put on the tinfoil hats again, right? Next, uh, let's see, it's August, September, October. October in San Diego is Autodesk University. And you're like, well, why are you talking about Autodesk when we're talking about Bluebeam? Because remember, a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, Nemechek and Autodesk said, hey, let's uh, be friends. Let's uh, try to figure out what we can do to, to merge uh, activities together. And it sounds like tinfoil hat, I'll bet you a nickel, that um, we're going to find out some things that's going to lead to, um, you know, perhaps a different integration because Studio Projects is powerful on its own, but so is Autodesk Construction Cloud. And with this talk, maybe that's when they're going to do it. I don't know. But uh, that was kind of a shocker to me to, to see that pop up. Yeah, and we had a conversation about it in tinfoil hat saying competitiveness of nature of projects just didn't fill the void that was needed. And now that new partnership, why not keep what their true and told use of sessions was, right? That's unbeatable, undoubtedly. Um, and integrate that like we've always wanted it to in the past into docs. Bring yeah. back that integration. You can do your punch lists on the go, right? Because the only other competitive product that was near that would have been, um, that will be via, you know, your mobile device would have been plan grid, right? So maybe they just stopped doing R&D in that, kind of a trade off to the projects, into sessions. This is all speculation, by the way. Yeah, it comes 100%. true. Yeah, <laughs> we have no as, idea. We are guessing. You know, seems kind of right, right? Yeah, and, and this is an interesting thing, right? Because, um, you know, I, I'm talking about Plan Grid. Plan Grid was a standalone thing for a long time. Autodesk came in and acquired them, sort of stopped development of it. So we're at this sort of perfect mm -hmm. storm. We've got all these ingredients for something cool to happen between all these different entities. And uh, it, it, I think that people want that. I think I want to see that, but um, we don't really have confirmation. It's like, if, if you're feeling froggy, let's jump. But uh, I'm not really sure what's going to happen. But the studio uh, message made me put on my little, uh, 
you know, conspiracy theory hat that something else is going on. Um, because the functionality is it's good, but it, it, it could be better. And uh, yeah, uh, where, where this will leave review for iPad, my guess is dead. Um, they did release an same update. Same spot. <laughs> but um, with everything being cloud-based or, or having the new app, um, you don't really need it as much. But there are there is that functionality that's in the review for iPad app that doesn't exist anywhere else, like the audio. Um, so I don't know. It's going to be an yeah. interesting couple of months. Because I would just mark up via Bluebeam Cloud in sessions on my phone versus the iPad. I guess the only thing you'd want to do from an iPad perspective is have it because better connectivity, as we discussed before. Um, but I would just say it's going to be in the same state. They haven't really put a lot of dev time into the application of the iPad app, more so on the phone app. So, Yeah, but the, you have the larger screen, Apple Pencil. Like, There's a lot to be said for having that device, especially if you're trying to navigate a large plan set instead of just playing on your phone like that, you know? Yeah, but they still have cloud on the iPad, right? They just, I guess if you want to use, you could use the desktop sessions on the iPad, but then you'd be wanting to get a Surface Pro because then you'd have the full application. There you go. Yeah, always, always wondering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting couple of months for sure, and I think we're going to see more updates as they come out. Um, there we go. Um, so yeah, Liz, People want an iPad app online. People are talking about they want the iPad app. Why? Because over the past couple of years, everybody said, hey, you need an iPad if you want to do anything in the field. You need an iPad if you want to do anything in the field, right? And now they've got the iPads and like, oh, by the way, you can just use your phone. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, four or five, six hundred dollars, however much they cost anymore. Like, that's not free. You know, it's a great device, super handy, responsive. Like, let's just keep using them. But, um, I but I the think actual. their, yeah, I think their iPad app answer is them saying their iPad app is the cloud app, right? That's what they're saying. But I think what people like Liz is saying, they want the desktop application on the iPad. But I think the issue there is like, who owns the rights to that, right? Because Apple has that weird thing with the App Store, if you haven't watched the documentary on it, where they essentially own the application. Yeah, but Matt put a, a, a really good point. The app's only 10 bucks, and it's got more functionality than Bluebeam Cloud. However, it's only 10 bucks, And guess what? It's perpetual. And everything's subscription-based anymore, everybody. And it's getting real flipping annoying. Um, you know, if you want a Bluebeam for the desktop, it's 410 bucks a year, which makes sense. But there's no money in and developing a ten dollar app that's why there's been no development to it right because it's doesn't even put a blip in their bottom line i'm guessing um whereas having a legion of subscribers um that have that continual uh income flow is, is the model that everybody's going for um uh, i don't know if you saw the news last week i had to google it several times just to see if it was a hoax but logitech will never get another dime of my money because um, they were saying that they're going to create a forever mouse. That, that's their goal is to create a forever mouse where you buy a mouse with a subscription. And for that one subscription, you get up to 10,000 clicks. If you go over 10,000 clicks, you get have to go to a different subscription level. Could you imagine that? Like, how stupid is that idea? But for that subscription, you always get updates and you'll to get new hardware and like you'll they'll keep it going forever. There's no way that's going to happen. That's what they're wanting to do. And it's like, could you imagine like, oh, I, I can't click on this right now because I might, I don't have, I can't afford the extra 10 bucks a month or whatever it was going to be. But it was like, yeah, 20 bucks a month to use your freaking mouse. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. But uh, subscription, I mean, BMWs have subscription heated seats. You know, everything else is like, it's just crazy to think about. But um, and, token you know, transaction, crazy. Yeah, token transactions. But uh, it is what it is. Um, yeah, it's the same thing, uh, Liz. HP, your printer won't work if you don't buy their ink. You got to, like, subscribe to your own printer. Like, but I bought the ink. It, it's just for crazy. But I get it. 
it's all about the shareholders and, and keeping everybody happy and making sure that you've got that sustainable income. I get it on the business sense, but as a user, come on now. So yeah, we'll see if that actually comes out because I'm just trying to think of how many times I click my mouse a day. Oh yeah, would, would exceed ten thousand clicks. I would almost think. Yeah. And then there's going to be the arguments of like, no, I only clicked 9,994 times. I'm, I'm counting. Yeah. You know, are you going to get, get a odometer on your, on your thing? Yeah. Well, what if they went to like your keyboard strokes then? Yeah. Yeah. Especially the amount of backspacing that I do. <laughs> <laughs> or that delete button rude. Go on back, some right? of our folks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. I now, thinking about 10,000 clicks, like how many clicks do I do a day? You know, yeah, it was just an interesting, interesting thing to, to pop up, but there's going to be never more recorded news. it. Yeah. There's going to be more news coming soon. Uh, a couple things that we can't quite talk about yet until the calendar changes, but um, it, there's going to be some interesting stuff coming up for Blue Beam. And, and that's what I don't want to discredit, you know, as much as the subscription model of, of things like a mouse or heated seats for your BMW or whatever else is a little bit ridiculous. I do feel like there's value in the Bluebeam subscription, like the, with the rate that they're putting out new updates and putting out new enhancements and things like that. It's like, cool, the money's going somewhere, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of talented folks at Bluebeam and Autodesk and all these other subscription, these uh, software companies, like these are brilliant minds and, you know, they, do, they have, deserve a living wage too um and and the fact that nothing's cheap anymore um you know prices are going up everywhere so I don't, i'm not mad at that but i, I want to see value in it but if i buy a product and have to pay a subscription to use it that's well hey they said they were going to update it oh yeah yeah <laughs> maybe maybe can't forget yeah. that olive oil is 20 dollars a liter what's a liter just kidding Anywho, let's get into our software today. So we we did Revit review for Revit users because we were going to maybe start to do like review for Civil 3D and AutoCAD users. And we might still do that, you know, revisit some of those plugins that come with the different versions of review. But this one was also highlighted by the number of support tickets we've had recently on, you know, trying to figure out different functionality. Is this an Autodesk problem? Is it a Bluebeam problem? Is it a user problem? You know, what's going on here? So we figured, let's just hop in the software, talk about a typical workflow, if you're a Revit user, on how you're gonna optimize Revit for use in review, right? Because most things that we're doing anymore is gonna end in a PDF somewhere. So let's just dive in and see what happens. So I will turn it over to Michael to fire up the, the Revits and go from there. I thought you were going to say rabbits to make a joke, but I preemptively joked to myself. It's okay. Um, so one of the main issues was, this is just the out of the box. One of the main issues was stamping and sealing, if I remember correctly. So we'll just go through and print a combined sense here. And basically what was happening is that, ooh, I want to do everything. Yeah, that's fine. When you were going to do the in re review, the advanced feature of stamp, sign, and seal under batch, you would get a gray screen. So let me go through and hit OK. Where is this going to save? And I hadn't seen it on one of my older sets, but someone had said that it does it now and it's been recreated so i'm going to go through and test it and i'm wondering if it's just every odd set or something in that nature um, but we'll go through through and figure that out together let me bring this over here because i feel like i'm talking into the space without seeing mr early's face i rhymed uh -huh. good old snowden towers hey it's actually i feel like this is a lot better starter project and some of the other ones. Hopefully, not all of you that are utilizing Revit are in a disagreement with that, but I feel like it's a lot better data set. It's 
what I play with when I'm in there because that's the only thing I know what to do with it. Yeah, but you remember the other ones that they had. The, so once this goes through, pretty, one. yeah, <laughs> I know this sheet set was made in Revit as well back in the day. So we'll go through and just do a quick batch sign and seal on this. And essentially what signing and sealing does and why you would want this feature and correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, if I remember this is in complete tier, but basically what this allows you to do is to go through and place a stamp. So the stamp would essentially be your seal. You would have it at the scale created for your seal, but the signature part so that you're actually going to certify the document after it's being placed so no one can modify it will then have that selection. And my Revit's not responding, so we'll go and hit next. I'll probably just do a couple sheets. Uh, but essentially what was happening is they were only able to see a corner of each page as they went through. So if I went to the next page, the next page, the next page, they weren't seeing the full title block. So what you're utilizing with batch sign and seal, because I'll explain the process and then I'll go back and check on Revit, um, is talk about what this does. So you're able to add a digital signature right so i have mine and everyone can always make fun of mine my wife was talking to me the other day she's like is that really an e i said yeah it's an e and then some scribbles that's my signature so if you want to try to copyright that it's a bird <laughs> oh it's not a bird okay. it's an e for ichave cursive oh, right okay and then i do like maybe three or four back turns you know <laughs> Pretty creative, I would think so yeah. myself. Um, but anyways, going back into here, you can have a date. It's a bird hurricane. You can have a date, or you can go through and apply a seal to this. So the seal would be your stamp. So as long as you have some stamp created, you do have the option to go through and place a stamp. So there are some stamp seals out of the box. This one obviously isn't to scale. You'll always see me scale this down. However, you can't scale it down here. So you just have to be aware of whatever page size you're going to be creating is the correct size of seal, right? Like this isn't the correct size for this specific um, title block size, but you would just have it pre-created and would have created it at that. And then you would be able to apply this on every single page on every single area, right? So if I go to here, where it says that it is not used for that, but we'll just go through and sign it there. Then you would what you would do is you'd go and you'd hit, okay, so is this going to be on specific pages? So we'll just go here, check it there. Looks good. Hit okay. Okay. This doesn't show, okay. Thank you. So where am I going to save this? Because it's creating a new document. So you have uh, the oh, this is the Revit one. Copy of it. Yeah. yeah. It's populated from Revit, right? Yeah. That pop-up wasn't from my review environment. That pop-up was from my Revit. Um, but so from here, I can still move the stamp. And you could have said flatten. So if I go back into that when I utilize it for this, you could have said flatten. So with this specific one, you have your seal. You could have flattened it. But my signature is not able to be moved, right? If I populate the forms field, I see that I have signatures in here as well from that perspective. And then we can also go into our, hmm, signature validations here too. It's because I haven't saved it yet. So it's going to unvalidate it. But if I were to go through and save it, it would validate them, which are not validated yet. So let's go into this one and talk about how this one just came from Revit, as we all saw and see if I'm able to replicate it. And it may just be on specific sets, and it may be on specific sheet sizes. 
that wasn't labeled in the support case that we got recently, right, Mr. Early? Yeah, and it could be a template thing. There, there's more to it, but the fact that uh, they felt that they were going to elevate it to much higher than you would expect. Yeah, and I didn't print this at scale or anything, too, so not the correct Revit settings, but we can see that I can see the full sheet sets. That's funky. All 55, not an issue. And I'll go through and just revalidate that with a smaller at scale set. But that was the issue is that they wouldn't, you would only be able to see the top quadrant. Has anyone else had that issue before? There's a question from Mr. Matt. Um, would it make more sense to create a signature with a seal or create a stamp with a signature? It's up to you, Mr. Matt. If you so that always comes back full circle. Do we want to because I I remember back in the day, right? You'd have a seal and a signature also in Revit, and some folks were fine with that. You can have that same process in review. And I'll let you explain that with the stamp and the seal as I go through and print this out because I won't be able to multitask. Right. Um, so Jason. there's a couple different schools of thought with that, right? You can create your signature as a stamp. So it looks like your handwritten stamp. Or you can create a stamp that has... Oh, sorry, I'm going to go back because it is confusing, right? Signature with a seal, right? So you digitally sign the document and the, the the symbol that appears is your seal, or you can create a stamp that looks like your signature. There are different versions of of that workflow, and some are going to be more secure than others, and some, you know, a lot of it depends on your jurisdiction. Some folks won't accept the digital stamp. It has to look like a signature. Some of them have to have a wet stamp and wet signature and all that other stuff, but um, I, I'm, I'm torn. I like the stamp to look like a stamp, but I also don't have a stamp. So you stamp holders out there, Liz and others. Um, what do you do? Yeah, so it comes down to preferring, do we want to... Oh, it's already in use. Um, do we want to be able to secure it, or do we not care that it's in a format of a stamp that's one of the main big issues too is hey right anyone can come in and get this stamp that has my signature that's never close to being the same but do we want that right can people just go in and stamp this this could be applied to all pages i can hit apply to all pages right what pages do you want to apply to Save it to my desktop, replace that other one. Sorry, three things at once on my computer. Um, but yeah, as you're going through, right, you have that ability to stamp on all pages. And that way, you, you're, you're utilizing the stamp. This can be and can happen all day. That's fine. Do you care? That's up to you, the stamp holder, right, in terms of signing it and being able to sign it to authenticate it from an engineering perspective right or from a architectural perspective do we want that the other way would be you have a seal which is just your blank seal by jurisdiction right and then you can come back and sign it by a single signature that's more secure where it looks like a wet seal and some i know even in some states they do require a digital signature in the seal so that they can see the authentication, which would be just the typical signature, which I'll do on this one. So essentially, this looks a lot better for folks that were maybe wondering about that plotting and printing issue that I was having from the size of the scale. So this is at scale, and I'm not having the issue. So I'm wondering why some folks are and some folks aren't. But basically, what you can go through and do is instead of this, I know some are requiring it to be an actual digital signature, and you would have made one probably that doesn't have this logo in the back, right? Right. 
some jurisdictions are requiring to see this digital authentication key on that signature. That could happen. But what you're doing here is you're certifying it from a signature perspective so that you know if anyone made changes to this document as well. And also, they can't get access to your signature because it's your signature. So just a couple of options, depending on how secure do you want your signature to be? Mm -hmm. So going back to the chat, Matt mentioned that the signature version would not allow movement after placement, but the stamp version would allow you movement. And that's exactly what you saw Michael sort of demonstrating there. So, um, you know, you don't necessarily want the movement, but at the same time, if you're trying to fake it, so it looks like you actually wet stamped it, it's not going to be in the exact same spot every time. But yeah, you're right. If once the signature, you can't get moved. Yeah. What, I mean, this one, I could flatten it, like we were saying, and allow markup recovery, so then this never gets moved. But Matt's saying you you would want to move it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, great comment here from Jonathan. Is, is it true that after you add a digital signature, it's not possible to modify the PDF at all? Like, you can't take the signed pages and insert them into another PDF, right? That could be problematic if you're the sub-consultant to your prime and once your sheet's added to a compiled submittal. Yes, that does become problematic, but that's why sets exist. But there are other limitations there. Michael, you look like you've got this whole response figured out. Yeah. I I think we all have to understand that we're in the digital age. So what you can do from a security perspective is understand yourself if someone modified it coming back to you. Yes. What you can't prevent and I'm not going to say it on here, but there is a way with any type of access right of a PDF to have something happen to it. I'm not going to give too much detail in the process because I don't want to just have it out there on YouTube because it's going to be up on YouTube um, to, to get that PDF and then modify it however you want. But what you can do as the owner of the PDF is understand that your data, if you ever capture back that PDF that has been modified, was it originally my modified PDF? Yes, that would be certifying the document or the signature, and you can check the authentication key behind it with Bluebeam. But I will tell you, we live in a digital world, and there are not that complex of ways for me to grab somebody's PDF and allow myself to edit it. Does that yeah. sound clear? Yeah. It's That's... one of those things like <laughs> if you use the software on Ripley, yes, correct. It will not do that. But you'd be surprised how often we get messages of like, hey, this PDF's password protected. How do I get around it? It's really not that difficult if you know how to use the internet. But uh it's 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 wild that um that there's so many just blatant disregard for, I, I don't care if it's password protected, I need to go in there and do my thing. Yeah. Um, so in this digital age, it does make things a little different. Um, and there are some limitations to what we got going on, but you know, our workflows, you're, upset, you're absolutely right, have been combining stamp sets from different people in the same set for years, decades, right? Yeah, so there there is a process to certify it where people can you know, slip sheets and all of that. So if I go through and I process this, I'll show that um, when we're going through and combining, right? Because I can go through and save as. Mm. Why are you doing that? I, I, I learned something last week. So we're talking about, you know, uh, you know, security of, of PDFs makes you miss paper sometimes and uh, markup shop drawings that have been signed and sealed. Um, however, I, there's there's some legality there and what i learned last week kind of blew my mind so um before this recent job transition i was on technically our hr team here at atg and i learned from that team that it is illegal to write on somebody's resume if you send me your resume and i'm interviewing you and i print it out and i'm writing notes on that resume it's illegal for me to do that because it is a legal document 
Hmm. Isn't that wild? So like, I if you, that. It, you're, it's your digital rep or not your digital, but you're like this document is a representation of your skill set and everything else that you're right that you've got. So if you put anything on there, man, it's really, really wild. And I went back on the Wayback Machine of how many times I've sat in an interview and had people write on my stuff in front of me. So, yeah. Hmm. A little knowledge drop there. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea. So what you can do, if I go back in, I can look at my signatures, right? They're all validated now. And if you're ever wondering about the authentication key, we went through a long rabbit hole about explaining it, how you can transfer it, because I had no idea about any of that. And I believe we did a video on it, or I might have shown somebody in a class. If we need to make a video on it, we can. Um, Because basically, if I send this to Jason, I think Jason has mine now, but... um, it won't be green, right? It'll just show that it's not authenticated. But essentially, if someone comes in here and modifies it, right, you'll get a new version of that old one. Now, what you can do is if you're like, I don't want people to even be able to modify it, but I kind of want people to add sheets or things of that nature, you can come in here and set a security behind it. That's one way. You can change permissions in this thing. Oh, it's because it's already set. It won't let me click out of it. So the permissions are already set as a state. Let's go through and try the other one. Nope, can't because it's already set from that original signature. So let's do it from this one. We'll save as because we all know. I don't want to um, modify this one. Hmm. Typical. So we'll go to this one. <laughs> All my data sets I've been saving over really lately. Bad habit. Um, so if I wanted to go through into here, you do have the option to certify the document or secure it. So you can go to security. You can say change permissions. From here, you can say, hey, it will require somebody a password to do something, not to open it, because that would just be, well, I mean, maybe you do. So there's that option. But there is the password, and can you allow printing? Yep, they can print. And then what modifications can they do? Can they fill in the form fields? Same thing, and adding markups, insert, delete, rotate pages. They have all of these different options, allow copying text or graphics, allow extracting content. So there are options here, right? So that's kind of up to you to decide on how you want to go through and utilize these, and then your encryption from that perspective. That's just a password. The other way would be to certify. So password is not meaning you're going to have that option over in the um, signature field where it's going to say authenticated or certified. You can do that by going to tools. And then from there, you have the ability to do a certify. So options. And again, as always, we answer questions live. And that was kind of like the deter from Revit. So if there are any additional questions on that, we can too. Uh, not related to that, but before we get back to Revit, um, Doug has a question. Has anyone used a review on an interactive display? I got one for our office and it's getting installed this week. Any tips? Um, that's still pretty cool. I, I know we had played with Was one. Was that the one at AU? Oh, Exxon, yeah. That yeah. big table, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I know we've talked about it before, but I don't know if anybody else had one. I know Isaac had one, but we haven't seen Isaac in a little while. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's a good idea. Um, it's like a big iPad. Yeah. It's like taking your PDF and like printing it out on paper so you can see it big. Yeah. Oh wait. Um, you know, and being <laughs> able to interact with it would be would be pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's a sixty five inch tablet, a, a digital drawing table type of thing. Kind of cool. Sounds expensive. Like a digital drawing board table, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the ones that we saw, I mean, it would be cool to have, but is that to like have a put in the center of a big table to then have a conversation around that table, you think? Um, I, I don't know. I've seen like highlight reels from Autodesk and Nemechek and some other software makers that show like these big things out on a job site where you would have like a common area. If you need to go check the plans, you go there, you do your stuff, and then you go do your work and whatever. Um, 
before, you know, in the old days of of paper, we would have light tables and we'd have a light table out in the, the conference room or wherever else where you can go put plans on one another, flip on the light and uh, and and compare documents that way. Now, this is a essentially a digital version of that. If we mm. want to compare documents on a 65 inch light board, we could. While we're out in the field mm-hmm. and it probably has a strong internet connection, you can just, you know, have it right there. People can go through and compare. That would be cool if they had it like a board. We all know malls, right? how malls used to have the map and i recently used a map probably about a half a year ago and that was the first time i ever used the mall map i didn't realize that they were there so bad on me um but basically yeah you can click it and go somewhere you could essentially utilize that same process right as they're out in the field going through and checking out information as if there was just one big a couple of big ones in some area with strong uh internet connection connectivity from those two That'd be cool. Yeah, it's uh, funny. I was walking through the DFW airport on Friday, on my way back from Little Rock, and this lady's like, "Do you know if there's a Chick Fil A in Terminal D?" And I'm like, "I don't know if there is. Let's go to the map because they have them every there. You can say, hey, 'Hey, I'm in Terminal D, and I want food, and it will show you where everything is.'" And it blew her mind. And and some gentleman was like, "Hey, I'm on my way there anyway." <laughs> but anyway, um, pretty cool. But today's episode of review for Revit has gone down separate rabbit holes, and I'm going to open up another one um, because Doug mentioned XCon, and I don't remember if we talked about Bluebeam Live. Did yes. we talk about Bluebeam Live? We did. Um, talk about us going? No, just talking about it in general. Oh, yeah. So Bluebeam Live is happening in four different Five different areas. Cities. In the United States? Is it five? No, okay. one's... Uh, so... And instead of XCon before, where there was a two day, two or three day event in San Diego, um, where people could learn from one another and it was a cost involved and registration and all that. Now Bluebeam is doing Bluebeam Live. So five or six different cities around the world, uh, I think New York, uh, Miami, Dallas, Los Angeles, and Sydney and London. Yep. Something like that. There's, um, I know there's four here. Yeah. Because it's Dallas, San Diego, New Earth. York. Yeah. And Miami. somewhere in Florida. Yeah. yeah. So it's going to be something where it's free to attend. It's free. It's an all yeah. day, one day thing. The CEO of Bluebeam, um, some of the folks from Construction Brothers podcast, uh, Fred Mills for London. Um, Lots of different folks are going to be there. It sounds pretty cool, and the fact that it's free is is wild to me. But also the location of these things. They're all going to be mainly in stadiums, like like football stadiums and baseball stadiums. And that seems like a lot of room for uh, a one-day thing. So take a look at it. I think it's live. Let me pull up the link um, if anybody's interested in, in going to that, because I think they're coming up. <laughs> so... Yeah, six cities, three continents, one epic roadshow. Um, so yeah, August thirteenth in Sydney, uh, August twenty seventh in Dallas. Yep, uh, I'll September, be at the Dallas one. September tenth in uh, Miami, September twenty fifth in Los Angeles, uh, New York City, uh, October twenty third, and London on October thirtieth. So yeah, the first one's coming up in Sydney uh, next week. Sounds pretty cool. The Dallas one will be August twenty seventh. Um, yeah, you can just go to live.bluebeam.com and get on the list. Yeah, I, I wonder how it's going to be. So on that live, it says live from like highlights from XCon. So are they going to be, what's the style going to be? Um, they've got the whole set list. Let me, let me pull it up. I'll share my screen. Yeah, right. I'll stop um, sharing. I was going to talk about like spaces and stuff. So if anyone wants to know about that, we can turn back. back. We still got time. So this is the Dallas, right? So August 27th, home of the Dallas Cowboys, 100,000 people could fit there. Second largest dome structure on earth. Um, But yeah, check in breakfast keynote. It's like a typical conference, you know, customer presentation. Uh, I don't know what that's about. And then different class tracks, you know, advanced tips, you know, who's doing what um pretty pretty cool and then 
you know, AI stuff and then launch, then getting started, then product roadmap, which will be exciting to see more customer presentation. And then that's it. So that's a whole day of free learning. Um, free. Free, which is just wild. Um, but this is super cool that they're doing this. Uh, Let's look at the lineup. Brothers. Yeah. Our buddy Scott will be there. Um, Scott. Um, and yeah, Ashley and, and, and Luke and like there's some solid folks that are going to be going to all of these. So um, hop on the wait list if you can attend any of those uh, would be pretty darn cool. I, I, I'll go to Sydney. Or Miami. Versus London. What would you prefer, London or Sydney? Um, ooh, that's a solid question. Um, probably Sydney. Um, when I was in New Zealand, I sort of fell in love with down there. So I haven't been over to London yet. But yeah, I think London is where Fred. Ooh, will be. wait, go back. Down. Scroll up New York, October 23rd. New York City? When what is about? AU? Oh, AU is the 15th through the 16th, I guess. Yeah. So this is the week after. You would have made it back. Yeah. That'd be a lot of traveling. But, uh, anywho, I thought that was cool. All Do you right. think they're going to have a booth at AU? I was just thinking about that because you and I are both going to be at AU. So yes. that'll be fun. Do you think they're going to have a booth at AU? I'm, I'm going to look. You go back and your Revit stuff, and I'm going to go double check. Blue Beam. Yeah. Blue Beam at AU. Okay. I, I don't know if they'd let them in. Beth said, I heard booths costs are oh. up. Over two hundred percent. No, five hundred percent. Yeah, it is ridiculous. I don't. I will withhold my thoughts until we return. <laughs> but I was just in that conference center a couple of weeks ago for the Esri conference, and it's a big space, and it's really really nice. Is it better than the one in Vegas? Uh, the conference hall depends. Last time I went to Vegas was the Venetian one. That's where we were at last year. They yeah. switched between. They were switching between Venetian and uh, Mandalay Bay for a while there, and I preferred Venetian over Mandalay. But um, I, I prefer San Diego over all of them because it's just easier to get to. It's San Diego. The weather, the burritos. Come on now. Um, yeah. But California's it's a CA price tag. Yeah. I don't know how you quantify over 200%. Is that because, I mean, there's no way they get, well, I guess because they get taxed on the revenue brought in probably. Cost, yeah. Yeah, their costs aren't that much, but yeah. Supposedly, trying to trying to be careful with my words here, but the Esri conference was 20,000 people. It was, you know, about the same price, maybe a little bit more than AU for for an attendee to go to but they also overflowed into the neighboring marriott and hilton now the marriott for those who remember xcon that's where xcon was just in the bottom of the marriott and it was fine a uh, esri conference took the conference center and all of the hilton and all of the marriott AU is also going to do that but AU is only going to have half the participation or the attendees of of the Esri conference. So I don't know how they're going to spread them out entirely. Um, you know, the last AU that I heard of in New Orleans where like it was like a half hour walk between classes. It's probably going to be a good 10, 15 minute walk between classes uh, this year at Autodesk University. But again, it's a it's a beautiful facility. Um, you know, you can see the outdoors easier, unlike Vegas where you get trapped in there. Um, some of those views are even up the water and the bay and the port. And uh, yeah, it'll be an interesting time. So if you're going to AU, <laughs> Michael and I will be there. Uh, Michael will be speaking with Matt, and I'll be at the booth. So we'll be having some fun. I laughed because someone said it'll be subscription based. As it will speaking. be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, twenty five cents a minute, right? We're gonna go back to that model. But anyway. yes, but we'll be there. It'll be exciting. If you want to come, say hi to us. Maybe we can snag up some old mcr swag to throw but either way we'll have atg swag there um definitely at the au booth 
But going back into Revit, so you do have the option, a couple of options um, that are beneficial in my opinion and especially help with downstream effect, which would be, excuse me, the coffee, um, exporting rooms to spaces. So that is definitely a huge benefit for some folks and some folks find it annoying, but downstream effect you can help in other ways by having this. And maybe you just have one page that, well, of course, you would only have one page. You're not going to be showing rooms in all your pages, but um, a leveraging your rooms to spaces. So as long as the rooms are showing, your rooms will then be converted, Revit rooms. Um, and I always say it like that because just being aware that rooms are different than spaces, but there's also spaces in Revit. So rooms from Revit, to spaces in review. This again allows for that tracking and that ability to see information from a room level. And also you can do like one overall after it's been exported to help with either punch lists. Um, you could do bill material list to delivery to a specific area. Um, there's a lot of things that you can utilize from that and even like a cost perspective down to a breakdown of each room right? There are a lot of different things that you can use with spaces. And those are just like three of them. I can think off the top of my head that already are being done from the design team within Revit, at least architecturally. Um, sorry, there are no spaces to spaces, um, for you MEP folks and structurally we don't have any rooms or spaces. So again, being able to go through and leverage the rooms to spaces. That is one great one. You can also go through and use back in the day. They didn't really have a good um, batch selection of sheets. Now they do. But from here, you can still use the same thought process um, where now Revit has it built in <laughs> when they didn't. They didn't in a couple of iterations before. Um, you can come into here and select what you want plotted and printed. And then even on those sheets, you can select what you do not want plotted or printed from this perspective. So just a couple of additional options if you wanted to just use the add-in um, versus going to the file print method as well. So there was a question, how did you get to that setting box? Yes, so that is under add-ins. That is where your review add-ins will be if you do not see them. Um, was it admin is where they are now? Yes, select my admin. Here are your add-ins for what you do have installed. So I have 2024, 23, 22. I believe 25 is up, right? I don't remember. Maybe it's not. I don't think 25 is up yet for Revit 25. I haven't installed Revit 25 yet. Um, is it up? I are you looking? Um, okay. The compatibility page. But with that, once you select the add-in, you will see change settings here. And these are the settings when you print. You have to print from this, by the way, when you're doing the export to rooms to spaces. So you can hit create PDF, but first you wanna make sure on your selection what you're gonna have for this set. And then you can say create file. Uh, Revit still says 2024 on the compatibility page. Okay, thank you. And then from here, you also have the option to do either native Revit settings. So you could have had your pre, like I set up that this was gonna be this within Revit. So when I said native, whatever Revit has predetermined, it's gonna set this up. This is that second settings page that you can get into into Revit. Or you could say custom, and then you can customize the way this is gonna be printing out. You can automatically have this PDF as we were just talking about um, security, pre-create with security prompts. So just like I showed in Bluebeam, you can have it pre-formulated so you don't even have to go into Bluebeam um, after the fact. And also you can create bookmarks. So you can go through and create bookmarks. They can also be dynamic. So if you wanted to go through and add those if you wanted to, you have options here to go through and create your bookmarks, which help folks down the road read your pages quickly and skip through them. So this can automatically embed them into that PDF set. And then from here, you can create the file if you wanted to, or you can, again, once these are done, once I hit OK, oh, man, no security. So 
it knows those settings. So now I can just hit create PDF if I wanted to, and it would go through and create it with these settings. There's also the 3D PDF. I've never hit the drop down. So this is the log and how do I. Um, but there is a 3D PDF if you wanted to go and create a 3D PDF, which we've done in the past as well. So if I open this up and I go to file and we'll just go, it's hmm, fine. You want to create a 3D PDF. Do not click anything while this thing's loading because it will freeze out depending on how big your 3D PDF is. Um, but you do have the option to go through and create a 3D PDF if you ever needed to. Cool. I haven't seen that one. Yeah, this is the residential ascent training manual. If I remember correctly, yeah. Yep, it is. Yeah, I can send it to you. But again, more options to go through and leverage 3D PDFs. So that would be that option that you can go through and create a 3D PDF from that perspective. You can also embed it as an IFC onto your data sets or the Unicode, which is what, U3 something? So oh. U3D. Yeah, there you go. Yeah if you wanted to embed it onto a page. You have 3D print settings, so what is this gonna do? You can have it predetermined. And again, it's everything that's in the view. So if you wanted to scope box something, you could, or selection box, sorry. I guess scope box would work too. Um, selection box, you could too. Very cool. Yes. Which part, 3D PDFs? Yeah, I mean, I, I no. Doug, Doug said, "Yeah, more people need to know these exist." And and you're absolutely right. Like, I know we've showed them off a, a dozen times here on MCR, but I, I haven't seen a whole lot of like support cases come over or other clients like saying, "Hey, let's collaborate here." But it makes so much sense. So it's much brilliant. sense. Like, how hard is it to send somebody? Hey, I know you don't have Revit, but do you want to see the 3D PDF so they can conceptualize, right? We all have been in the industry and can mostly conceptualize from a 2D perspective, but how awesome is it to be able to get a 3D perspective of a set? You can throw this on a page, like throw it on a page um, or s just... Section, I show wouldn't... me the floor plan. Like, that's the cool part. Yeah. So I don't think this has predetermined views, but we can go... Like, I would probably create some views... Here, that would be like that floor plan level, like you could do in Revit, orient to a specific view. Um, but I mean, you can come into here and just do a cross section. Hold on. You got all sorts of loss there. I I think it's upside down. Pivoted upside down one way. Whoa. Thank you. So from here, right, we can go down to click the arrow. Make sure you click the arrow. Thank you. And we can go up yeah. a little bit if we need yeah. to. You went a little far. There we go. Look at that. That's just the coolest. And from here, we can, you know, save this view if we wanted. And you can also mark up in there. So it wouldn't necessarily still show in 3D, but if, and you can't measure in there, but if you needed to say like, Hey, make this uh, bay window bigger, or you know, add table for six instead of. Five. Yeah, I was going to go to like a table because a little mm -hmm. bit easier, but yeah. Super cool. And then you have your market view. We still have our top level. 
We have home. It doesn't remove the box. Will it add the box? Top level, it does. Okay. But you had to unclick it out to get out of the box. Hmm. Okay. Then there's your markup. Definitely great. Mm -hmm. I dig it. Super handy. So, um, you know, Bob had mentioned rather than send 3D PDFs, find the Autodesk 3D viewer much more useful with the section options. But that assumes that you got to have them go download something. You know, I think this workflow assumes that you've used the Bluebeam before and you can just view it without needing to download anything because you already have it. Yeah. Okay. In that viewer, can do you get all the element properties and stuff like that with it too? I don't know. I, I've never used the viewer. Not the 3D viewer. And, you know, honestly, most people are using Autodesk Construction Cloud too, which works great for viewing this stuff too. Yeah. But, oh, there's no download? Well, sounds like we got a future topic there, Bob. We'll go back and, and compare. We'll add that to our comparison. We do our, yeah. our update uh, here. We'll have to actually go and look <laughs> at the viewer. So is that like a static Revit file as the viewer that you send somebody? Not using ACC, right? So we'll have to go look that up. Yep. 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 Well, with that, you still have the... I would want to know if you have this option too, where you can click specific elements, right? And highlight it and have that option. So just being aware that there are the 3D model tree, which is another added benefit from a 3D view perspective. But if you wanted to, you can always add something onto a PDF going to edit, not on a secured PDF. You have the option to come over to here. You can go to 3D uh, PDF content. I know they hide this thing down into here. Let's see if I have an IFC on my desktop since I don't. That would have been great. Um, yeah, who knows where we hide this stuff anymore? Um, I, I, yeah. <laughs> it's but, one of but, those things where you're like, yeah, I know it's somewhere. It's a beauty of doing things on the fly. <sighs> Yeah, the thing is, I know it's going to take longer than a minute to get me. We'll bring that up next time. But yep. basically, the file code, right, you'll be able to embed it. So you can you can mess around with it. It's a, it's a U3D or a IFC right here that you can throw on a PDF that you can send with your PDF set. It's pretty cool. So I know we went way off the rails today a little bit, but we came back on to finish it up. Um, lots of good stuff here. We talked about a lot of things that we're going to need to expand upon, you know, coming up pretty soon. And uh, in the meantime, uh, good to be back. We will see you all next week and have a good one out there. Have a good one, everyone. Thanks. Hey there. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and check out some of the other content on our channel. 